Quasars are the beasts in the universe. They are one of the most fascinating, useful, and one of the least understood objects in the universe. Every galaxy in the universe is composed of millions of stars arranged in spherical, disc-shaped, or in a much more complex density pattern. Every galaxy has a nucleus. This nucleus is dense and obscure region which has stars, gas, and dust densely, densely packed. In some cases, due to accretion events, the nucleus becomes active and begins to emit high energy electromagnetic radiations. These are called quasars or QSOs. QSO stands for quasi-stellar objects. Both of them means the same. A quasar has a black hole surrounded by an orbiting accretion disk of gas. Gas falls towards black hole. The region becomes extremely hot. High gravitational pull of black hole keeps this hot gas intact for very long until it escapes in a burst in form of electromagnetic waves that can be observed at infrared, radio, visible, ultraviolet, and even in X-ray wavelengths. The most powerful quasars have luminosity greater than 1000 times luminosity of Milky Way-like galaxy. This means a quasar can emit electromagnetic wave with intensity which is much greater than the luminosity intensity that is exhaled by 1000 Milky Way galaxies combined. Post World War II Radio astronomy began. Cosmic radio sources were detected confirming radio galaxies existed. In 1958, Geoffrey Burbage found a reservoir observationally in the universe that had energy approximately equal to 10 to the power 60 ergs. Just to give you an idea, the output of the sun is 3.8 into 10 to the power 33 erg per second is the luminosity output of the Sun. The mass of the Milky Way galaxy is 10 to the power 12 solar masses. This means that the luminosity output of Milky Way galaxy is around 3.8 into 10 to the power 45 or per second. The object Geoffrey observed was throwing energy equivalent to 15 galaxies per second. No shit. However, discovery of quasar is always credited to Martin Schmidt, who along with discovering the radio source 3C273, also measured its distance in 1963 using 200-inch reflector telescope at Palomar Observatory. Schmidt found that the 3C273 source was 2.5 billion light years away. In his interview, on 50th birthday, Schmidt said, Oh, clearly, yes. I certainly saw in the spectrum of 3C273 that it was quite simply the hydrogen spectrum in emission with Balmer lines and that it was shifted by about six of their wavelengths to the red, indicating rapid motion away from the observer. More distant objects are receding at a greater rate. And since the object looked like a star, this was stunning. What was happening? It clearly was not a star. Stars don't do that. They have very small redshifts, up to 0.2% only because of their movements, never bigger. And this was 16%, 80 times larger. So what I was looking at could not have been an ordinary star at all. Interpreting, it was a cosmological redshift, which I soon did because it was so bright in the sky, the luminosity turned out to be very high. And that was remarkable because it was immensely brighter than normal galaxies, even the biggest galaxies. So here you have something that is out in the universe. It's more luminous than an entire galaxy and it looks like a star. It was an astounding experience. Let's now talk about physical properties of quasars. Quasars are stars like objects identified with a radio source. They throw variable light. 
This means that the flux of the light varies with time and the time scale could be of hours, days or even of months. Quasars emit in wavelengths of IR, radio, optical, X-ray and even ultraviolet spectrum. Quasars show large redshifts. This means there are sources in our universe which are millions and billions of light years away. To observe quasars, of course, you need telescopes. Telescopes have filters fitted in their lenses. These filters could be U, B or V. The U filters, for example, allow only ultraviolet light to pass through it coming from the source. The B filter allows only blue light coming from the same source and V allows only visible spectrum. This means that the transmission coefficient of ultraviolet light in the U filter is the highest. The transmission coefficient of the blue light in the blue filter is the highest and the transmission coefficient of the visible spectrum in the V filter is the highest. The luminosity in, el in every filter for a given source is then recorded as U, B and V magnitude. Quasars by and large have lesser values of U minus B than most of the galactic stars and they are said to be bluer to have an ultraviolet excess UVX. The plot is a U minus B versus B minus V plot, often known as the color color plot in astrophysics. In this plot, the red dots denote quasars. This property of quasars of being shifted towards the negative side of the U minus V axis is used to distinguish stars from the galaxies. Most quasars have U minus V value less than minus 0 0.4. The colors of the chosen objects are then obtained and those bluer than some fixed value of U minus P, say that fixed value is minus 0 0.4, then are identified as quasar candidates. For every quasar candidate, their spectrum is then studied in order to study their spectrum in detail and also to evaluate distances. As you can see, the first spectrum in the image is nearly is a nearby quasar, which is a model spectrum of the sun. The other spectrums are of real sources redshifted because the quasar is far off. Because quasars are distance ob distant objects, any light that reaches us is redshifted due to metric expansion of space. From cosmology, we know that the redshift is given by the formula lambda naught over lambda e equals 1 plus z where lambda naught is the observed wavelength of the source, lambda e is the emitted wavelength of the source, and z is the redshift. z is the value that tells us how far the object is. Suppose this is the spectrum that we are studying. When we see a spectrum like this, say of sun, which is the top graph in the spectrum, we know that this line must be h alpha, this much must be h beta, H gamma and so on. When we see spectrum of a source other than that of sun, say this spectrum, then we see that the spectrums are shifted. The shift, this red shift in the spectrum is then associated with the distance of the source. We identify that this line then must correspond to this line, this line to this, this to this, and so on. We do that for every source in principle by making a comparison between the spectrum of the source and that of the sun to know how much there is the shift in the spectrum of the sources with respect to the sun. We then realize that the entire spectrum of every source is red shifted. The entire spectrum could have been shifted because either the object is too far off and showing a cosmological redshift or the object is moving away showing the Doppler redshift. 
So lambda e is then this value that must have been actually emitted. Lambda o is then this value that we observe today. And on the basis of this formula, then one can calculate the redshift for a given source. Using the, the observed value and the lambda emitted value, we can obtain the redshift for a given source whose spectrum we are observing. Recently, in a paper by Carmeli, they showed that the relationship between the cosmic time, which is the age of the universe, and cosmological redshift for Hubble constant value equals 70 is given by this formula. Let's now check this formula. For z equals infinity, the t cosmic would turn out to be zero. That is, at z equal infinity, the age of the universe was zero. It was the Big Bang. This means that the source at z equal infinity must be 14 billion years away from us today because the age of the universe is 14 billion years. And that was the beginning of the universe. At z equal zero, the cosmic time comes out to be 14 billion years. This means that the source must be zero giga years away from us. The source is very close. Light would take zero time to come to us from the source. And that's why it's zero giga years away. For the source 3C273, the redshift is observed to be five. That means that the age of the universe must be something. Oh, I'm sorry about this line. It's not the age of the universe. It's how far the object is from us. Oh, I'm sorry, it's actually the age of the universe and you would have to subtract this value from 14 billion years in order to calculate how far 3C273 is from us. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a nice thing that I made a mistake. Now I can leave it as an exercise. Thank you.